I was fascinated with computers when I was as little as a seven year old. So I actually sold my video game to buy my first computer. Oh uh, wow. And I, I never really thought I could become anything else but a software engineer. So I'm actually glad it worked out pretty well. That is Gorov Ketterball, Chief Technology Officer for the MTX Group. I'm Josh Burke, a developer evangelist for Salesforce. And here on the Salesforce Developer Podcast, you will hear stories and insights from developers for developers. There, Gorov is describing how he got his first ever computer, a computer, by the way, he still has. Today, we sit down with Gorov to talk about a variety of things when it comes to commerce development, including Commerce Cloud itself, and also mobile development, development that Gorov became familiar with back at his job at MediQ. Yeah, so some of the early projects that we did were uh, for a platform called Symbian, which is now dead. And again, mm. we did uh, stuff on BlackBerry, which again is no more now. Um, <laughs> and when the iPhone launched, I, I'll be very honest, I was a little skeptical as well. Uh, mm-hmm. because nobody had seen a device like that and uh, to be able to do those things on a phone back in those days it seemed like a crazy idea when we were used to physical keypads and all of that uh, right. but as we started developing applications i think uh, being developers we realized that it opened up so many other opportunities which were not possible with uh, the classical mobile operating systems and then android happened and uh, it was always more of a volume game with uh, so many other players coming in but i think the the one thing which it did well is uh, break the monotony of uh, ios and apple otherwise it would have been a very one sided ecosystem and i would say around 2010 11 after that it was just an android versus ios game for developers everything else kind of fizzled out Right, right. And that is kind of interesting because when the iPhone first came out, I mean, BlackBerry was kind of the king of the hill at that time, but you really couldn't have a device less like a BlackBerry than the iPhone itself. Absolutely. I think BlackBerry ruled the enterprise. I mean, it was the de facto smartphone, so to say, in the enterprise world. And for the iPhone to come in and uh, in a matter of years uh, displace it and just kill the whole company, I mean, and completely <laughs> conquer the enterprise segment, I think that that has been a fantastic achievement. Yeah. So let's bring that towards e-commerce development. How have you seen the growing importance of mobile when it comes to commerce development? I I read a report which said that almost 70% of e-commerce transactions worldwide are done through either a mobile phone or a tablet. Mm-hmm. So I think there is no doubt that without phones and tablets the world of e-commerce would not be the same as what it is today. Any time you get a package from Amazon, the person who delivers the package typically uses his phone to know your location to get an acknowledgement on the package and in mm. most of the cases even the person who's ordering stuff is doing through a phone and i think it's made uh, e-commerce more accessible and i think that was the need of the r because e-commerce existed long back as well i mean the old old world of ebay and craigslist was forever there but the world of amazons and uh, the others uh, did not exist and i think they really benefited from this mobile revolution and i think if one sector has made the most of it it is e-commerce all right so that's a, that's a really interesting point i think because a lot of people think of e-commerce in terms of you know that digital point of contact for sales where somebody has a website to sell products but there are all these other points of contact in between where yet yeah, as you said the person who's doing the delivery the person who's going on route and and that taxi driver who like now he can get paid via his iPad it, it feels like mobile devices have really opened up a lot more opportunities Absolutely I think it's a it's a complete ecosystem all together and a lot of people do not realize the nuances behind uh, that ecosystem and I think a lot of companies have struggled to kind of make the most of that ecosystem because they have failed to understand the specifics mm-hmm. in that sense I think Salesforce has done really well I think they realize that there is an enterprise play there as well as a consumer play there and they made sure that they checked the two right boxes B2B as well as B2C So let's um let's break that down for people. What is B2C versus B2B and what are some distinctions there? A uh, B2B is a business to business transaction and a B2C is business to consumer transaction. So to compare them in a B2B scenario you are essentially selling to other sellers who would in turn sell to the end buyers. In a B2C scenario you are actually selling directly to the end customer. So in that sense B2C is somebody who's listing their product on an amazon site mm-hmm. and there are customers who are ordering from there 
B2B is more like an Alibaba or even Amazon does B2B where I would list my products as a distributor and mm-hmm. then dealers would buy off me and they would then in turn sell it to customers. And what features does Commerce Cloud have that kind of goes across both of those? Yeah, so I think you you raised an important question there. What is Commerce Cloud? And I think that has been kind of a, a question which has been uh, widely debated ever since Salesforce <laughs> started these commerce acquisitions. Uh-huh. So originally, Commerce Cloud actually meant the B2C commerce platform. They acquired a company called Demandware. Mm-hmm. Um, the company itself earlier used to be called as Intershop several years back. But when Salesforce acquired it, it was called Demandware. Mm-hmm. Salesforce then... Uh, changed that name and started calling it Salesforce Commerce Cloud. And it was fondly abbreviated as SFCC. But since developers want to take shortcuts, uh, nobody wanted to say Salesforce Commerce Cloud. So people started calling it Commerce Cloud. And that's how how the name came. And now it's known as B2C Commerce. uh, Mm -hmm. And the distinction is there because now Salesforce has another offering which is called B2B Commerce, hmm. which is another company which Salesforce acquired two years back called Cloud Grace. Gotcha. Okay, let's focus on Commerce Cloud and talk about it from a developer experience. It feels like a very uh, similar but different feeling from what a Salesforce developer would expect. Like, for instance, uh, describe a realm versus an org to me. Yeah, so Commerce Cloud, I mean, you can always draw parallels between Commerce Cloud or B2C Commerce and Salesforce. Mm -hmm. From a technology standpoint, it's a completely different stack. So you Mm -hmm. do not use Apex, Visual Force, or Lightning, and it's all JavaScript. So it's all JavaScript in the front end and JavaScript in the back end. And obviously, they have their own proprietary languages like uh, ISML, which is a markup template. And they are continuously upgrading the stack and going in the same direction as Salesforce. So just to answer your question, a realm is very similar to an org. It's a logical segregation, similar to how it is in Salesforce. It's basically the place where all your customer code and customer data exists. Uh, A realm is exactly similar, but it's the terminology that B2C Commerce uses. Gotcha. So let's talk a little bit about how Commerce Cloud used to function. Describe site genesis to me. Yeah, Site Genesis is a reference architecture. So back in the days when uh, the company was called Demandware, um, Mm -hmm. and they used to ship their platform to the customers. So customers had two choices. Either they start from scratch, or they use something which is like a seed project, where they can use it as a starting point and then make modifications and get their site or storefront up quickly. So Site Genesis was that reference architecture. It's a fully functional website. Uh, it has the back end, it has the front end, it has the database, and then you can customize it based on your needs. So that reduced the amount of time that a customer would need to build their own site and have it deployed in production and up and running. So it gave them a good starting point and uh, kind of took the donkey work out of building a website, I would say. Gotcha. But it's kind of old school. Like It sounded like there were some problems with its MVC model. Like How would you describe it as not a true MVC model? Yeah, so site genesis, I mean, the architecture served well for several years, I would say more than a decade. Mm. Um, but I mean, it, it was meant to be an MVC architecture, but it lacked some principles, like there were no separation of concerns. Mm-hmm. Um, the framework ISML, which I mentioned, again, it worked well for simplistic pages, but as I mean, stores grew larger and pages became more complex, the templates became bulky. And then typically when we envisage MVC, we say that the model represents your database, the view represents your uh, view layer or the presentation layer, and the controller is the business logic abstraction. So in that sense, the model really wasn't the true database layer. It was a lot of scripts also being uh, clubbed into the model layer. So Uh, over a period of time, I think they realized that this architecture is good enough for now, but it will probably not scale in the future. Got it. And, And kind of to that point is if somebody was starting a new website, would there be any compelling reason to use Site Genesis versus anything that's newer? Not really. So uh, after Site Genesis, they introduced a framework. It was initially called MFRA, which was Mobile First Reference Architecture, mm-hmm. because one of the issues with Site Genesis was that uh, it was primarily designed for the desktop. 
Mm. And although it kind of worked well on uh, smartphones and tablets, but it was not really an optimal experience. Got it. So in that sense, they've built a new framework pretty much from scratch using, again, JavaScript and a lot of modern frameworks. And mm-hmm. they called it mobile first reference architecture because it was exactly what it sounded like. It would run beautifully on your smartphones and tablets. But then it gave a wrong impression that it was uh, it was heavily focused on mobile and then desktop users would be left behind. So they kind of standardized the Got terminology it. and started calling it storefront reference architecture. This has more of a true MVC model, correct? This is a pure MVC implementation, yes. What kind of object model comes out of the box to help make it run? Yeah, so similar to how in Salesforce you have standard objects and custom objects, in B2C commerce, you actually get a pre-built data model, which typically covers all your most common e-commerce use cases. Mm -hmm. So the common, tell me some of the entities that you can think of when you talk about an e-commerce data (laughs) model, what would those be? Right, so like product, like cart, I'm assuming some kind of categorization structure, etc. Bingo. Yeah, so you you called it products, cart, categories. These are all products that are there in the pre-built model. And the best part is that you can actually add custom fields to these uh, standard objects and you can extend them. So that was going to be my follow-up question is, how, what does that look like? Is that similar to a Salesforce custom object, custom field, or is it more like a database experience? Yeah, so it's, um, I mean, in that sense, B2C commerce platform has been designed with a lot of thought process. So you can actually do both the things. You can create your own custom objects, which can create custom fields. But if you only need to supplement a functionality of a a standard object or a system object, as we call it, then you can Mm -hmm. actually add custom fields. So for example, the product object, uh, has everything that I need, but say mm-hmm. I want to add something like a, a grouping or a or an attribute which does not exist. So in that right. case, I would probably add a custom object to the product object. But if I'm creating some functionality, like I want to create a newsletter for my e-commerce store and mm-hmm. I cannot find a system object, in that case, I would actually go ahead and create a custom object for it. Got it. <laughs> so it sounds very similar to the Salesforce experience. Uh, exactly. But- so let's talk about the the controller layer. You mentioned earlier that it's it's all JavaScript. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. And what does that JavaScript look like? Is that like a nice ECMAScript six t- style class structure? Yes, it is ECMAScript. Yes. Nice. Again, um, this goes back to demandware days. Um, the ECMAScript. Mm-hmm standard being followed earlier i believe it was ecma 4 and then Mm -hmm. they also had uh, proprietary scripts which were also called as uh, d scripts but over a period of time everything has been standardized on javascript again the the thought process is very similar move away from the proprietary architecture similar to how uh, salesforce has done a fabulous job with the lightning web components i mean in true sense i i heard a phrase i think it it was at some conference you're democratizing your development environment and opening up opportunities so i'm really happy that b2c commerce is again going in that direction as well well, and it sounds like for very much the same reasons, because like when I was looking at some of the examples you've had in your presentations, a controller in Commerce Cloud looks like a controller in Lightning Web Components. Like we're getting true. that leverage, leveraging the education of JavaScript across development platforms. That is true. So you mentioned a markup language earlier. What is comprising the view structure? Yeah, so it used to be called uh, ISML, uh, which was Internet Store Markup Language. And in in the earlier earlier world, it used to also be called as InterShop Markup Language. So it was very similar to any templating framework that you would have, either a handlebar or something like a Django. So the idea was that you would create the templates when the client is executing the request. So for example, the user sends a request. The template fetches the data based on the client request and generates HTML dynamically. So that concept worked well. I mean, it worked well because you could include templates, you could trigger a call from a template to another template. It sufficed those use cases. But again, as the pages got bulky, I mean, it kind of hit limitations. And that's when Mm. they decided to kind of revamp that whole architecture with SFRA. So SFRA, instead of just bluntly, depending on ISML templates, it uses a concept of modules and super modules. So that way, it's been architected in a way so that it can actually be performant as well. Got it. Nice. So let's talk a little bit about integration. What kind of role does Einstein have with Commerce Cloud? 
Yeah, so uh, I think one of the things which Salesforce has done well is uh, integrate Einstein as a layer in most of their cloud offerings. And I'm really happy that it came to Commerce Cloud as well. So in Commerce Cloud, there are multiple use cases. One of the most common use cases is um, based on a user's past purchasing history. What is it that they're likely to buy next? I think that's one of the use cases which uh, the Einstein connector for Commerce Cloud has there are other use cases as well, but I think that's one of the most common use cases. And based on that, it actually generates predictions. Mm-hmm. And you can use those predictions to surface those products so that the user is able to see those more clearly. Or those are the products which the user would likely see first mm-hmm. because there is a higher probability that uh, he'll, he or she will buy them. So we have that kind of like Amazon style predicting your behavior or, or suggesting new products built right into it. Exactly. And that functionality is very sophisticated and uh, it's actually a blessing in disguise because earlier when you you had to build predictions, you had to build it manually. So you would basically look at the data, you would define, okay, these are the trends I'm getting. Let me put this product on top and Mm -hmm. then let me, this is not selling too well or this is not Christmas season. So let me take off these products. But now with Einstein, I mean, you can program these rules as uh, business logic without any code and uh, it actually generates everything in runtime. So that's the true power of Einstein. Nice. Now, from the Salesforce side of things, I'm used to a wide ecosystem of APIs, bulk, SOAP, REST, et cetera, et cetera. What kind of APIs are out of the box for Commerce Cloud? Yeah, so Commerce Cloud has its own uh, framework of APIs called Open Commerce APIs. Um, mm-hmm. So you cannot actually build a commerce uh, e-commerce site uh, in a silo. You So the the site that you see is just one piece of it and it's the consumer facing piece of it. But in the background, there are a number of things which are going on. Typically, there is an inventory management system. There is a master database from where the product information gets fetched. There is an order management system. When you check out your products, a call goes to a payment gateway. So mm-hmm. Typically, all of these are built as cartridges. Uh, we mm-hmm. call it as a cartridge uh, in terms of a basic building block. And most of these cartridges, what they would do is they would use an API interface to interface with external parties. Got and uh, the standard that has been uh, followed is Open Commerce API. And it's a fairly well-documented and easy-to-use standard. So it, I think that's a, that's a really important point because... Back in my days of working for a commerce site, you know, it, it would, people would come to the experience and I think it was very easy to say, hey, we're just, you know, we're going to build up our own website. We'll just throw a cart together. And I'm like, do you have any idea how complicated a shopping cart actually is? <laughs> that is true. Yeah, but I think uh, with the OCAPI standards, we, we call it Open Commerce API. But again, mm-hmm. as a developer, I mean, we abbreviate it as OCAPI. It's RESTful. Again, it's very well documented. So typical Mashery or Swagger style documentation that this, if you send this request with these parameters, these are the responses that you would expect. And I think it's made life um, much, much simpler for uh, developers uh, to be able to build um, these cartridges, especially around integration. Nice. Now, with those integration points, is there anything out of the box that works directly with Salesforce Service Cloud or Sales Cloud? Yeah, so um, they actually published a bunch of connectors. Uh, So there are two that I'm aware of. I think there are more. So Salesforce calls them solution kits. So the idea is that uh, if you want to sync data from one direction or you want to do a bi-directional sync, then you can use these connectors or solution kits and they allow you to do that. So a typical example is a case information. So you would typically want to allow users to submit case on your sites. For example, if their payment failed or if they had some trouble with the order, they would want to raise a case within Commerce Cloud. And typically you would want to push that case to a service cloud backend. And similarly for marketing cloud as well. Again, if you want to kind of trigger an email campaign for a specific set of users, you would typically need some kind of uh, interaction with marketing cloud. Uh, again, there is a lot of support. There is a there is a, a very sophisticated uh, solution kit available for marketing where you can actually define the overall journey like you do in a journey builder for all the users who are on your site and uh, clearly define touch points in terms of who gets what email at one, what point of time. So you also call this typical cross, uh, cross cloud architecture, and that is something which is gaining a lot of prominence. Mm-hmm. And personally, in my experience, I've also seen that a lot of customers who have bought Commerce Cloud 
were customers who were actually using Salesforce earlier. And the reason that they went with Commerce Cloud was that it's this seamless interface that if you are using uh, Salesforce, uh, the core platform or service cloud or marketing cloud, then it is much easier to integrate with um, the B2C commerce rather than opting for any other e-commerce platform, be a Magento or a, a SAP Hybris. Nice. Now, I saw a demo of yours from London's Calling where um, it looked like things like privacy and consent were built right into the website. So if I'm a developer working with Commerce Cloud, how much do I have to worry about things like GDPR? Uh, no. So as you rightly pointed out, the basic functionality around uh, compliance is built in. So GDPR was one of the compliances that was built in because one fine day when I was uh, when I opened my sandbox and I saw that notification, I wasn't sure what was going on. And, and since it was a sandbox, so I thought maybe I've screwed up some code, but then I realized. And so in that sense, I think Commerce Cloud is up to date with most of the legal standards and the compliances. And I think most regions and they do publish a, a list and an audit report uh, from a time to time basis and i think in that sense they have their bases covered nice okay so kind of an awkward question but what is required to get access to that development sandbox that's a great question so and to be honest i mean one of the pain points of commerce cloud development till last year was the entry barrier to commerce cloud development was much higher than what it is for Salesforce. So in mm -hmm. Salesforce, you sign up a developer org. It's yours for life. You don't need to pay anything for it. But for uh, B2C commerce till last year, it required you to either be a B2C commerce partner or attend one of the trainings. And I proudly say that because I used to do several of those trainings as a certified instructor. Nice. Uh, but... Uh, the, the limitation there was that uh, not everybody could attend a training or not everybody could sign up to be a partner right? Uh, because, it again, it takes some paperwork. It's a time-consuming process. So at Dreamforce, they announced on-demand sandboxes. So nice. if you are a partner, if you are a part of that program, you can actually you get an interface where you can spin up sandboxes just as you would spin up a Salesforce developer org. And I think that has tremendously helped kind of reduce that entry barrier. And uh, again, I mean, to be honest, I did not used to come across a lot of commerce cloud developers in the partner community till last year. Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, uh, I, I see that there are events being done specific for uh, commerce cloud because the developer base has just grown exponentially. And I think the easy access to sandboxes has definitely helped. Nice. So it, it sounds like we've been kind of touching the, on this uh, throughout the talk, but if I do have access and I have um, I have experience with Salesforce, like Apex, maybe somewhere in between Visual Force and Lightning Web Components, like what's the difficulty level for me to bring those skills into Commerce Cloud? You need a good understanding of JavaScript uh, as a developer, and I think some some background of data modeling and uh, database architecture. But otherwise, I mean, it's not a steep learning curve. Uh, you need to know the key e-commerce concepts, which again can be picked up relatively quickly. So since I've been teaching these courses for a while, I mean, I know of most of the times, I mean, people in my class, uh, especially when I was delivering these trainings at partners, about 80% of the audience were Salesforce developers. Mm. And... Uh, there are people who were actually so confident that they did all the exercises uh, in the trainings. And just a couple of days after the training, they took the B2C commerce developer certification and they passed. Nice. But I would say that uh, a typical ramp time is anywhere between three to four weeks. I think three to four weeks, you you get a hang of things. You, you start to appreciate best practices. You know, um, you typically are able to debug performance issues. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a reasonable time frame for anybody to start picking up uh, B2C commerce skills. And if somebody's gone through that training, they've got their certification and they're going to start their first like real enterprise commerce cloud project, is there any first in mind advice that you have for them? Yeah, so they have actually done a great job. So they have uh, put together a B2C commerce developer center, which is like, I always uh, do comparisons with the developer force site that we have, developer.force.com. Mm -hmm. That for me defines the kind of benchmark on what a developer portal across any technology should look like. I mean, you yes. should be able to see API documentation. You should be able to see examples. You should be able to see best practices. And I think the commerce cloud 
team the product team has picked up on that and i think they have they have put together and there it's a, it's a work in progress but i think they have done a good job so far so you can try out all the apis you have the release notes there um, there there is a lot of uh, reference to p2c commerce best practices which again is a good move because earlier everything used to be on a portal called exchange demand mm-hmm. exchange.demandware.com mm-hmm. uh, again the entry barrier to exchange was high you needed to be a partner or you needed to have attended one of the official trainings but this new developer portal is completely free and you can access it without any credentials and uh, so i would strongly recommend that people should uh, bookmark that and spend time going through those resources Nice. All right. Well, today I wanted to focus on B2C, but just kind of out of curiosity, what's the elevator pitch for the B2B side of things? Yeah. So B2B is a completely different proposition. And uh, Cloud Craze, they actually built this B2B commerce platform natively on Salesforce. Hmm. And I think that that was a big reason why Salesforce bought it, because till then, I think uh, nobody was sure, because B2B is all about scale. I mean, you... Mm -hmm. uh, Typically, an order would be like 500 products, even more. I mean, 500 is just a very small example. Mm -hmm. But B2B is all about scale and uh, less about diversity of products, less about user experience, but just about scale, resilience, and the sheer volume of products and the sheer volume of transactions that can happen. And I think it was a very solid product. And uh, I think it was 2017 or 18 when Salesforce acquired it. And then they kind of changed the name to B2B Commerce. Uh, The the massive advantage there is that you actually do not need to learn anything else to be a B2B Commerce developer. If you know Visual Force, if you know Apex, if you know your force.com data model, if you know custom objects, if you know standard objects, that's all you need. And you need to learn a little bit of commerce concepts. But other than that, you are good to go. And that's our show. Now, when asked about his favorite non-technical hobby, Gaurav did admit to being something of a bookworm, a hobby he's been able to catch up on while in quarantine in India. Since we are recording this in a time where I've been locked in my house for the last 45 days, I have pretty much managed to complete my backlog for the rest of this year. So... I've read about 16 odd books that I had on my radar. Uh, So, yeah, I cannot go to bed without uh, reading for half an hour every day. So I think this uh, this lockdown has been a blessing in disguise for for a reader like me. My huge thanks to Gaurav for the great conversation and wonderful information. And of course, my thanks to you for listening. If you want to learn more about this podcast, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. Thanks again, and I'll talk to you next week.